ఓకే కిచ్చ ధ్యానం Oh Bhagavad Gita by which Arjuna was illumined by Lord Krishna himself and which was composed of 18 chapters within the Mahabharata by the ancient sage Vyasa O divine mother destroyer of rebirth who showers the nectar of oneness upon us O Bhagavad Gita my affectionate mother on thee I meditate all the upanishads are the cows The milker is the cowherd boy Krishna. Arjuna is the calf. People of purified intellect are the drinkers. And the milk is the supreme nectar of the Gita. My salutations to the Lord, who is the source of supreme bliss, whose grace makes the mute eloquent and the crippled cross mountains. Hari Om Tatsa. Okay. Just another moment here with with the uh, yoga of devotion with chapter 12. Um the closing stanza, the closing shloka is this. And we'll take some of the commentary from from uh Swami Venkateshananda. They verily who follow this immortal dharma as described above endowed with faith regarding me as their supreme goal they the devotees are exceedingly dear to me and um to bring this commentary swami ji says dharm yam ritam is translated into immortal dharma so i mentioned yesterday morning also that sanatana dharma has a very similar translation in sanatana dharma meaning the eternal law and here translated into immortal dharma um dharm dharm yam ritam it is also immortalizing dharma you know, understand what he means by that right immortalizing dharma how do you immortalize you realize you're immortal ah you realize you're immortal um krishna makes it plain at every opportunity that his is not a new doctrine or philosophy but a restatement and reiteration of the eternal not just the oldest but the ever new dharma very similar to jesus as jesus was was teaching us yes? uh, I did not come to bring a new law. <laughs> uh, I came to bring life to the to the existing law. It is dharma the balance which sustains the universe and every living creation the cohesive force that keeps us together. It is not Hinduism, Christianity, Islam or Judaism in their restricted sense, but the very essence and soul, but their very essence and soul. it's eternal but capable of being reinterpreted and re-delivered from time to time and he gives this example he says wood remains wood but every human generation fashions some new gadget out of it putting it to different uses initially man made houses bridges and boats with wood when iron and concrete superseded wood in construction it was used for paper now man makes various garments from wood and all these have two factors in common wood and service to humanity so service to humanity being dharma and wood the uh, uh, material cause modern man though he does not discard objects out of does not discard objects of nature like wood sneers at dharma feeling it is out of date however it is eternal and can and should still serve man making his life happier and richer just as there sorry just as there are factories and research laboratories to discover newer uses for old materials there should be more spiritual research centers to rediscover this eternal dharma mm-hmm. this pattern of existence 
and suggest ways and means of applying it in the present day world. Mm -hmm. To the man of God, person of God, of course, these verses representing the eternal Dharma are like a blueprint for perfection. He builds his personality on their pattern, not by blindly copying, but by intelligently living. He lives as if he were a great devotee of God, for that is his objective. He grows in the characteristics mentioned in these verses and in the course of time is established in them. These eight verses are worth daily repetition, contemplating their meaning. Well, uh, so we can repeat them one more time before we move on to the next chapter. Is it okay? The eight verses starting with 13, which are, He who hates no creature, who is friendly and compassionate to all, who is free from attachment and egoism, balanced in pleasure and pain and forgiving. Ever content, steady in meditation, self-controlled, possessed of firm conviction with the mind and intellect offered to me, he, my devotee, is dear to me. He by whom the world is not agitated and who cannot be agitated by the world, who is freed from joy, envy, fear, and anxiety, he is dear to me. He who is free from wants, pure, expert, unconcerned and untroubled, renouncing all undertakings or commencements, he who is thus devoted to me is dear to me. He who, is, he who neither rejoices nor hates, nor grieves, nor desires, renouncing good and evil, and who is full of devotion is dear to me. He who is the same to foe and friend and also in honor and dishonor, who is the same in cold and heat and in pleasure and pain, who is free from attachment. He to whom censure and praise are equal, who is silent, content with anything, homeless, of a steady mind and full of devotion. That man is dear to me. And then the eighth, they verily who follow this immortal Dharma as described above, endowed with faith regarding me as their supreme goal, they, the devotees, are exceedingly dear to me. So do we see how those come together to, to really lay out the path of devotion, and the practice of devotion, as well as the fruit? So I want to share something. This just came this morning. Um, and it speaks to what happens when we actually practice it speaks to what happens when we practice. Um, just read a, a note. It's a personal note, but it's, but it's worth sharing. Um, it's from uh, Gopala's mother. <laughs> Alex, she knows him as. She says, Alex is doing great. Such a blessing and so much personal growth since last, he's working very hard and he's so kind. I'm very grateful. So to the one who practices this, who devotes themselves to it, the transformation cannot help but come. And one finds the Lord inside and outside. And so this is the practice of devotion, the, yes? So practical in this way. It completely transforms the life. So, um, and this is what we get to observe in ourselves and in others is this transformation. Um, okay, so we move forward. Um, but these eight want to be, if there's enough space to tattoo them to the inside of the eyelids, this is the, this is the one to do. <laughs> Um, okay, so we close Yoga of Devotion. Thus, in the Upanishad of the glorious Bhagavad Gita, the science of the eternal, the scripture of yoga, the dialogue between Sri Krishna and Arjuna, ends the twelfth discourse entitled the Yoga of Devotion. And so this morning, 
we move from uh, we move to chapter 13, which also means that we're moving to the third of the of the. Remember, we've had the discussion about the Bhagavad Gita being divided up into three portions, mm -hmm. six chapters each. So, based upon the saying, the Mahavakya Tattvam Asi, that thou art. And the scholars say that the first six speak to thou, the nature of thou, you, you. So, our Lord Krishna is there speaking to us about who we are. Right. And of course, the second chapter is famous in this way, right? The self, capital is self. Immortal. Hmm. Never has been a time when you have not been, nor I, nor any of this. Yes? So, um, and then speaking of, of that, the highest, the immortal, uh, Krishna himself, and the universe, and what is this universe? And now we move to Asi, art, mm -hmm. which, speaks to the, which speaks to the relationship between I and that. Uh, it speaks to the relationship between the self and that absolute, and how to attain to union with the, in the relationship. So that's the, that's the last six. So we began this last six, Chapter 13, with the field, the yoga of the field and the knower of the field, which comes right to the point, the relationship between that and this. <laughs> right there. Oh. Lower. Okay. Hmm? Lower and higher, like nature. I and thou, I and thou, yeah, yeah. I and thou. Um, God and me. Yeah. <laughs> the universe and me. Yeah. So Arjuna asks this question. He says, Krishna, I would like to know more about Prakriti and Purusha, the field and its knower, wisdom, jnana, and what is to be known. Sound a little bit like, um, um, oh my goodness, what's his name? Kata Upanishad. Nachiketa. Nachiketa. Sound a little bit like Nachiketa's question? Yeah. The big one? The last question? Yeah. <laughs> Krishna, I would like to know more about Prakriti and Purusha, the field and its knower, wisdom, and what is to be known. The Blessed Lord replied, the body is called the field, and the Sanskrit word here is Kshetra. Kshetra. And... Um, that's, we remember Kurukshetra. Kurukshetra being the battlefield, right? And Kshetra here, the body. So the body is called the field, Arjuna. Whoever understands the field is said by sages to be the knower of the field. And Kshetranya is the knower of the field in Sanskrit. Swamiji talks a little about this relationship. He says, Prakriti and Purusha are terms which mean almost the same as Shetra and Shetranya. So almost the same as field and the knower of the field. Purusha means the absolute self or consciousness. Prakriti, God's manifestation. Ultimately, they aren't different from one another. Ultimately. We, never, we can never separate them. Actually, they're one and the same, like dough and bread. One is unbaked, the other is baked. Purusha is the unmanifested that we don't see, nor can we make any use of. Prakriti, unmanifested, is Purusha. In this chapter, Sri Krishna describes these. Chaitra, he says, can be translated as a house, a place, or a field. Chaitranya is the one who dwells in the place. Holy places are often called Chaitras and the presiding deity, the Chaitranya. But here in the cosmic sense, Chaitra is Prakriti and Chaitranya is unseen consciousness behind it all. 
Another definition for Kshetra and Kshetranya would be the knower and, sorry, the known and the knower. The most common meaning in the uh, common meaning is the field and the knower of the field. Nature or that which can be known is aptly called the field because it is a field you can grow any, in which you can grow anything you want. Sorry, I read that improperly. Please forgive. Nature or that which can be known is aptly called the field because in a field you can grow anything that you want. Whatever you sow, you reap. If you sow good seeds, you get good growth, sow bad seeds, and you reap bad fruit. So I think we can catch the allegory that he's providing of the field, right? And the way we relate to a field such as the garden down below. Mm -hmm. um, so the garden is not you, but you as the gardener have the opportunity to plant, to sow, and to reap. So in the same way, this world is said to be the field, and you are the knower of the field. But, but he's made the point saying, the one who knows the field is called the knower of the field. So in other words, mm. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so okay. I'm here planting seeds. Can cause and effect be included in the, in the practice? <clears> oh. <throat> um, so there's a um, yes and, and no. I mean, okay. As we dive in, there's one ultimate cause, which is said to be Purusha, causeless cause. It has no cause in and of itself. Seed the seed. And, and here, from earlier, Lord Krishna speaks of his higher nature and lower nature. So you can say the higher nature, Purusha, unmanifest. Right. Huh? Lower nature, Prakriti, yeah. manifest. Okay. From what is Prakriti arising? Well, it has to be Purusha. Mm -hmm. That was discussed. Uh, but now that we're in the field... Now that we're in the field, are there causes in the field? You can answer that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And an example would be anything. Just pick something. The seed and the coin. Huh. So the cause would be Sita Devi's appearance. Mm -hmm. However many years ago, she appeared on a certain day, right? And another cause would be Sita Devi has come to be in community with us. Right. And we, and other causes, we dearly love Sita Devi. And the effect would be birthday cake. Yes. <laughs> Her being seen. So, so in this case, both the causes and multiple causes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, because if we didn't love Sita Devi, would birthday cake have been an effect? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> So, but since we love everyone, birth cake is always an effect. <laughs> oh, so multiple causes, all of which are existent where? In the field. And there are aspects of the field. Uh, and the effect is also in the field. Uh, and it's an aspect of the field. Uh, oh. So in that way, both cause and effect exist in the field. But if you say ultimate cause, ultimate cause, so... It's the higher nature. Well, who is this Sita Devi <laughs> that appeared however many years ago? <laughs> <laughs> and if you go to the deepest sense of that, consciousness itself, now mm -hmm. you've crossed over to Purusha. Purusha. Yes. Yeah, Om. Oh. And here, Lord Krishna will no doubt address that more clearly <laughs> as we continue, because that's, that's it. There is the question. And Arjuna, understand this. I am the knower of the field in everyone. I am the knower of the field in everyone. To distinguish between the field and its knower is what is true knowledge. 
So he goes into a, Swamiji goes into a lovely commentary and shares his stories. So, so we'll read. Here Krishna seems to be answering Arjuna's unasked question. Are there many knowers and known? Are there many knowers of the field and fields? Or in simple language, are there many souls as well as many bodies? And Sri Krishna says, no, I am the self or soul in all of the kshetras, in all of the fields. The bodies vary, but I am life in all of the bodies. He continues, that's probably what is meant by, and he quotes the image of God in the Bible. God made everything in God's own image. Actually, the Bible doesn't exactly say that. It says God made man in his own image, not even woman. But the meaning is that God made everything in God's own image. If buffaloes could write a Bible, they would probably say God made all the buffaloes in God's own image. Whoever writes does it this way. Usually they don't mean to demean others or ignore them. Probably a few people, all men, were sitting together and talking about these things and they said God made man in his own image. I don't think they purposely omitted anybody. He continues to distinguish between, uh, and he's quoting Lord Krishna here, he says to distinguish between the field and its knower is true knowledge. And that's the extent of knowledge with which the intellect is capable of. Mm. So you talk about the supreme knowledge for the person, the highest knowledge that the person can attain to, it's the relationship between the field and the knower of the field. Huh? And the intellect can know the field. It cannot know the knower. In one sense. Huh? In other words, it doesn't cross over. But it knows the knower in another sense and becomes firm in that knowledge. Huh? Does that make sense? Just knowing the existence. Yeah, and that I am that existence. Huh? Yeah. Oh. So, and then you say, well, tell me a little bit about yourself. And the intellect says? Body, mind, no. Nothing. Nothing. Silence. Silence. Because there's no answer. Well, because you are silence. Give it a shot. What to say? <laughs> Aham Brahmasmi, that's as far as it goes. <laughs> that statement that Mahavakya is the ultimate of the intellectual attainment. I am God at one. I am Brahman. I, yes. <laughs> I am the Father at one. Yes. You want to know about the Father? Please connect with the Father. You and the Father are together too. <laughs> But this, thank God, this the intellect can attain to. So, so to distinguish between the field and the knower is true knowledge, is, is what Krishna says. This is the highest knowledge, yes, says Krishna. He's speaking of enlightenment and discriminative knowledge. So again, enlightenment refers to intellect. Right? The light is already the light. Ah, so the light doesn't get enlightened. But the bodhi becomes buddha. Ah, the bodhi becomes buddha. Ah, so buddhi means buddha. Enlightened intellect. D is intellect. Bud is the light. So, ah, so that's the term. The term enlightenment speaks specifically to the intellect, to the to the discriminative discriminative faculty. And so it comes to know, I am the light. Uh, I can't speak to the light. <laughs> uh, oh, I can confirm that the light exists. Yes. I worked it out. The light exists. I can confirm that, that I am the light. I've worked it out. How it happened, I really don't have a clue. 
<laughs> it's said to be the causeless cause. And as far as I can tell, that has to be true. <laughs> because before I came, I know nothing. <laughs> Conscious mind speaking. Oh. So he's speaking of enlightenment and discriminative knowledge. Discriminative knowledge. Remember, intellect is also called viveka. Mm -hmm. Right? Or the, the power of discrimination or discernment. We normally say discernment these days. To discern between this and that. This and that. So this is silver, this is brown. This plays music, this holds a place in a book. So this is what this Viveka does. Uh, and this is the field and the eye is the knower of the field. So this is also, uh, you can say, the highest discrimination, the highest discernment. It's between the real and the temporal, the, the ephemeral. Hmm. Um, so this one also is, um, is a bookmark for us. When we ask what is to be known, then we, we will have to come back to this. This is the highest knowledge. The relationship between I and all of this. Right. Yeah. Okay. Field and the knower of the field. And the one who knows that I am the knower of the field and this is the field, what can harm such a one? Nothing. And what will there be fear of? Nothing. Uh -huh. <laughs> and what will there be anxiety about? Anger about? Right? Yeah. Oh, so yeah. that is what is to be known, Lord Krishna says. This is what is to be known. Of the reality, of the perceived reality. So, viveka is the capacity to discriminate between what the essence is and what its modifications or manifestations are. Never neglect this discrimination. Swamiji says, never neglect this discrimination because this discrimination is the highest discrimination. It is the most important accomplishment of the person. It is the point at which the person ceases to be a factor for you. <laughs> ceases to be a problem for you. Oh. Two children go to a chocolate shop and see different shaped shop chocolates. Round ones, square ones, globes. Some made like elephants, some like cats or dogs. One picks out an elephant chocolate. His brother takes the dog chocolate. Will the shopkeeper say, give me $1,000 for the elephant and 10 for the dog? No, he's not worried about the names and shapes. He'll just put both together on the scale and say, give me so much per pound of chocolate. He doesn't care if it's an elephant or a dog, just how much chocolate it is. The seller looks into the weight of the chocolate, the buyer into the name and form. The child who takes the elephant might say, ah, the elephant is so tasty. The other one might answer, no, no, the puppy is much tastier than the elephant. The children might even fight about it because they, see, they don't see the essence. But the shopkeeper knows that the reality behind both is the same chocolate. <laughs> That's true knowledge, knowing that the ultimate essence and the names and forms are really one and the same, but in different levels. True knowledge is the ability to distinguish Purusha, the Absolute Self, amid its manifestations, which are Prakriti. That is, to distinguish the Chaitanya, the knower of the field, from Kshetra, the field. When we stick only to name and form knowledge, it can be called secular knowledge. Limited knowledge, yes. Relative knowledge. Also, Swami Pramananda would often use the term relative knowledge, the, the difference between this and that, mm -hmm. but not touching this and that. Right. Huh. The so, secular knowledge. Knowledge of the essence is sacred knowledge. Secular knowledge without sacred knowledge always creates problems. 
<laughs> that explains our times, doesn't it? <laughs> Yes, the cause of suffering. The cause of suffering. It is the it is the cause of suffering, mm -hmm. and the cause of warfare, and the cause of of call out culture, and everything else. The cause of all of this. So, and here once again, the cause, lack of knowledge, only exists in the field. True. <laughs> yes, and it has to be resolved in the field as well. Didn't come to alignment with uh, Knowledge is also, is knowledge is a cause? Is knowledge a cause? Yes. Yeah. Of what? Contentment? <laughs> <laughs> yes. End of suffering? Mm -hmm. uh, and knowledge is where? In the field or? No. <laughs> no, the knowledge being discussed is in the oh, field. Yeah. <laughs> Within the field, you see both the saints, the saints. who know and the rest of us yeah. who don't know. Oh. Ah. And what are they to the knower of the field? Any of them. The field. <laughs> so you see the Dalai Lama, you listen to the Dalai Lama, you say, how wonderful is the Dalai Lama? Who does Krishna see? Krishna sees Krishna. <laughs> Krishna sees the field, the infinite field. The infinite field, which is his own creation. self. Not even creation. No. Just expression, expression of yeah. the appearance, appearance, okay. appearance. Mm. But thank God for the Dalai Lama. <laughs> <laughs> thank God for Swami Shivananda. Yes. Ah. Thank God for Ama. Mm. Okay, so we continue with the chocolate story. Moving on. When we stick only to name and form knowledge, it can be called secular knowledge, knowledge of the essence, sacred knowledge. Sacred knowledge without secular knowledge without sacred knowledge always creates problems. But if you keep the sacred knowledge in mind, you can just deal with the secular conveniently while enjoying the whole world. That's what my master, Swami Shivanandaji, used to say in a simple way. See unity in diversity. Then you can have fun with the variety or diversity. But if you miss the unity and just see the variety, that's a sort of lunacy, isn't it? And it's very hard to have fun in it. Getting caught up. Isn't it? Yeah. And it's very hard to enjoy the life if you don't see the unity. You can't enjoy it for long. Here we can see similarity, the similarities and the differences between the scientists and the yogis. In a way, our material scientists are also yogis, but they only try to know about the manifested universe. It's one-sided knowledge. They apply the same methods the yogi does, which is why we've been bringing the science back in our discussions here over the last, over the last couple of months. Mm -hmm. Because in a way, they apply the same technique, which is they just keep peeling away at the onion. Right? They keep peeling away, at la layer after layer after layer, neti neti, looking to see what's real. Uh, but, but in the other way, they're not yogis because they're refusing to come back to the center of it. They're only staying with the field and only continuing to look at the field, uh, which is why it, the field ends in a singularity, in a mystery, because of the relationship. Hmm. So 
So he brings up a good point. In one way, so it's one-sided knowledge. They apply the same methods as yogi does. In a way, they even practice the study of yogic posture and meditation. Scientists sitting in the lab may even forget to move their legs for hours and hours. They may forget to eat and sleep. What great tapasya or austerity they're performing. He says, see, the practices are almost the same. How many scientists lose their marriages and families? The spouses complain that they forget their families. In a way, they've renounced personal life. It's almost the same thing with the spiritual people. But the spiritual renunciate's main interest is knowing the essence. He or she is trying to know that which is to be known, by knowing which you know everything. Oh, okay, so we'll close for the morning. And pick up there tomorrow. Page 174. Oh. So what did Krishna just say? Who is the knower of this body? This Shetra that you're sitting in right now. So, so. What did Krishna just say? Who is the knower of this body? I. What did he say? He said, I am the knower in every body. Yes. Yes. Is that something you can work with today? Om Triambakam Yajamehe Sugandim Pushti Vaganam Orvai Rukmeva Bandanan Mritor Mukshiyama Mritata Om Triambakam Yajamehe Sugandim Pushti Vaganam Orvai Rukmeva Bandanan Mritor Mukshiyama Mritata Om Triambakam Yajamehe Surrounding Pushti Vardhanam, or by Rukmeva Bandhanam, Mitor Muksiyama Mritata, Om Sarve Sham Sastir Bhavatu, Sarve Sham Shantir Bhavatu, Sarve Sham Purnam Bhavatu, Sarve Sham Mangalam Bhavatu, Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha, Sarve Shantu Niramaya, Sarve Bhadrani Pashanto Makashi Dupapak Pave Asatoma Sakamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mritor Mahamritam Gamaya Om Purnamida Purnamidam Purna Purnamudashate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vasishate Om Shanti 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 O honorable Lord of mercy and love, salutations and prostrations unto thee. Thou art omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. Thou art Satchitananda. Thou art existence, knowledge, and bliss absolute. Thou art the indweller of all beings. Grant us an understanding heart, equal vision, balanced mind, faith, devotion, and wisdom. Grant us inner spiritual strength to resist temptation and to control the mind. Free us from egoism, lust, anger, greed, hatred, and jealousy. Fill our hearts with divine virtues. Let us behold thee in all these names and forms. Let us serve thee in all these names and forms. Let us ever remember thee. Let us ever sing thy glories. Let thy name be ever on our lips. Let us abide in thee forever and ever. And for all of the saints and sages of all the traditions. Let's rise for our tea.